pleasure. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. William H. Brackney as our guest speaker today. Bill is the Millard R. Cherry Distinguished Professor of Christian Thought and Ethics Emeritus at Acadia University. He is also a much valued uh, friend of the Centre for Baptist Studies as one of its research associates. And he's also a wonderful supporter of our Angus Library and Archive. Together with his wife, Catherine, he has recently established a travel bursary to enable scholars to come to Oxford to use the archive, for which we are immensely grateful. Bill's work is, I'm sure, already familiar to most of us. He has written widely on post-Reformation Protestant thought, especially the life and thought of the Baptists and the Radical Reformation. In addition, he's done major work in the area of human rights and global ethics from a free church perspective. His historical dictionary of the Baptists has just appeared in its third edition, and I would particularly like to draw your attention to his two recent articles in the Baptist Quarterly, volume 51, issues three and four for 2020, in which he develops the work of his earlier monograph on the Holy Spirit in dissenting thought through his focus in the Baptist Quarterly articles on Baptist contributions to theological reflection on the Holy Spirit and cross currents of the Spirit, very appropriate as we head towards Trinity Sunday shortly. I understand he's currently working together with Professor Roth Cagle at Elstal on preparing a new critical edition of the Baptist Confessions of Faith, which we look forward to in eager anticipation. So it's a delight to have you with us today, Bill, and I offer you my very warmest welcome. Now I'll hand over to my colleague Keith to add, add his word of welcome and to share a few further insights. Thank you very much, Christine. It's uh, a great joy for us in the Baptist Historical Society to uh, welcome our member, Bill, and uh, share with the Center for Baptist Studies. Uh, inevitably, uh, you tend to think back to the first time I met Bill, which is in the 1980s. And I wonder if he remembers the occasion. Uh, you brought a study group over to the UK. And as part of the itinerary, uh, you wanted the group to go to Wainsgate Chapel above Hebden Bridge, where uh, John Fawcett was the pastor. And uh, we arranged with the delightful Mrs. Butterworth, the church secretary, uh, to have a service there and I asked her, I was then General Secretary of the YBA, I asked her uh, if she could arrange an organist and John Nicholson, Bill and I would take the service. Uh, so we gathered with this tour group and of course we had to sing Blessed Be The Tie That Binds. I was uh, a bit uh, wet behind the ears in those days and I'd, whilst I'd been to Waynesgate before and preached there, I, I'd never chosen blessed be the tie that binds. <laughs> what I didn't know was that Waynesgate sing that hymn to a tune that nobody else in the Baptist world sings it to. So here were our uh, North American friends, eager, anxious to sing out uh, to uh, blessed be the tie to the set tune Dennis, and the organist strikes up with it, it must be a surely a Yorkshire dirge. I saw Bill's face drop. I was in the pulpit at the time. I went round to the organist with a little debate. He said, well, we always sing it to this tune at Wednesday. I said, this afternoon, we need to sing it to this tune because <laughs> our friends expect nothing less. Well, the organist turned the pages of uh, the music book and did play the right tune in the end, but uh, uh, it's been a great delight over the years to have uh, links with, with Bill, uh, know his work and support, to, to be on commissions of the BWA with him and so on. And uh, so it's a special pleasure this afternoon uh, to listen to his lecture, particular or particular, in search of when English Calvinistic Baptists became particular. Bill. It's our delight to have you with us, and we really look forward to what you have to say. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Christine, can you hear me? 
Yes. Sorry, I gave a thumbs up, but I think you, there may be too many people on the screen. Thank you. OK, thank you. First of all, thank you, Christine, for that wonderful introduction. Um, it, 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 this was supposed to have occurred last year, but in God's providence and the provenance of uh, COVID, here we are by virtue of uh, uh, Zoom, and, and I'm delighted, privileged, and very thankful to, to be here. Keith, I, you brought tears to my eyes of laughter. I remember so well, and my wife Kitty was there, she's here again. Uh, standing there in that chapel and wondering what in the world happened to bless be the tie that binds. But our friendship did indeed begin there as we were uh, there on the, uh, uh, I guess you call them uh, uh, hills of uh, Yorkshire. And, and that is a very warm memory. Sh thank you so much for sharing that. So I want to uh, begin by putting a, a kind of a uh, humorous um, subtitle to my lecture, which is um, a study in missing the obvious. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in, in a moment. Let me uh, begin by saying, I recognize that there may be those in the audience that need a bit of an introduction to what this lecture is all about. One might actually wonder why a North American is venturing again into 17th century English religious history. With our English brothers and sisters, we share a common interest and genetic rootage in early English Baptist development. We know where our roots lie. In the beginning of our Baptist tradition, there were at least, at least three major streams of Baptist life the general atonement types who believed that Christ died for all, the Calvinistic types who followed a limited understanding of the application of the merits of Christ only to an elect group of persons, and a third group that held to Sabbath keeping as an identifying mark. Those of you who know my work will recall my published interest in the general atonement position. In this essay, I am pursuing a key question in the earliest development of the Calvinistic part of our family. And now let me begin. From my days as a graduate student, a graduate research student, I have been taught not to take anything for granted, nothing, including the obvious. That is the driving force of this essay. Years ago, I began to collect notes about early Baptist names, Churches of Christ, General Baptist, Arminian Baptist, Calvinistic Baptist, Seventh-day Baptist, Leg of Mutton Baptist, etc. The early English particular Baptists have recently been in my focus. When, I ask my noble and learned colleague, Dr. Larry Kreitzer, did the term particular first connect with English Calvinistic Baptist and why? He frowned and replied something like, I don't know. That would make an interesting project. So, Larry, here we are. I also note the upsurge among Reformed or Calvinistic Baptists in North America and beyond in creating a history of particular Baptist as a dominant and continuing group. Being more inclined toward general atonement interpretations, my interest has been quickened. The question I place before us is this. In those early decades of the 17th century, especially in and around London, what is the origin of particular Baptist vocabulary? And if we can have Simon, the uh, uh, second um, panel, I'd like to give an outline of uh, where I hope to go. A starting place, where to begin, in my own pilgrimage, the Crosby myth, historical anachronism, a term set in place, the steps toward a working theological identity, and I can identify two stages, and then I would like to offer some conclusions. So that's where we are going. Simon, you can either leave that up or go to a, uh, uh, panel uh, with the speaker, but I would be very happy if the outline remained up. 
no less than the esteemed mentor of an entire generation, the Reverend Dr. Barry White observed in his typology of the earliest English uh, Baptists. The younger group, the particular or Calvinistic Baptists who arose among the underground independent congregations of London in the 1630s, believed that Christ died only for the elect. In a subsequent chapter, he identified this group as the first London particular Baptist of 1644. White was building upon an historiographical tradition that reached back to 1738 to 40. Behind him were A.C. Underwood, Ernest Keevan, William T. Whitley, J.M. Cramp, Joseph Ivamy, and Thomas Crosby. At the root was the assessment of Crosby, whom White has studied well. In his first volume, Crosby's description of that first congregation established an important precedent. In 1660, I'm quoting Crosby, a congregational church was established in London, of which Henry Jacob was the first pastor. His successor in 1633 was John Lathrop. At that time, certain members of the church holding Baptist sentiments sought its sanction to form a church of baptized believers. The approval was given. The new church was organized September 12, 1633. This community was the first English Calvinistical or particular Baptist church whose special history we can trace with the greatest facility. John Spilsbury was its first pastor. We shall call this the Crosby myth. One has only to select the major early English Baptist historians to illustrate Crosby's influence. 15 will suffice. Now, because I wanna move on to the real heart of the lecture, I will simply identify those that I survey in the uh, written version of the lecture. Joseph Ivamy, for instance, 1811, John Mockett Cramp, a half a century later, William T. Whitley in 1923, Ernest Kivan in uh, 1933, A.C. Underwood in 1947, uh, Barry White in 1983 and 1996, Murray J. Tolmy in 1993, Roger Hayden, Stephen Wright, Michael Watts, our own esteemed colleague, David Bebbington, J.F. McGregor, um, Mark Bell, and I will conclude that list with the most recent um, book that has been uh, to come forth in this vein of thought, Samuel Renahan's book, From Shadow to Substance, The Federal Theology of the English Particular Baptist, 1642 to 1704, in which uh, Dr. Renahan uh, traces particular Baptist back to even before, in the writings of Andrew Reitor, even before those that we are more familiar with in the 1644-46 context. My summary of those 15 um, people who have gone before in writing our narrative is this. Early and contemporary historians of the English Calvinistic Baptist adopted the Crosby myth projecting back into the 17th century the emergence of a particular Baptist theology built upon a limited view of the atonement of Christ. What is at stake is nothing less than historical anachronism. Here we follow the position of J.C.D. Clark that the most desirable, and I'm quoting, the most desirable terms for historical description are those the original actors used for themselves. On this point, Clark declared, we cannot assume any equivalence between our usage and theirs. It should be the first principle of historical inquiry of an earlier age that we need to attend to its own account of itself. He writes, the sin of anachronism in historical method is a mortal one because it rearranges the ideas and values of the past in ways which make past actions inexplicable except as attempted anticipations of the present. 
The historian is always condemned to see the past through a glass darkly. The introduction of anachronistic categories turns that glass into a mirror." Close quote. How exactly did the strategy of historical anachronism work? Firstly, for the most part, we do not wish to ascribe deliberate attribution of erroneous terms to original text. More likely, it amounted to uncareful reading of the texts. Secondly, denominational historians working backwards established genetic lineages in order to create a sense of continuity from a first congregation to a full-fledged denomination. Third, more critical historians seem not to want to tamper with honored denominational traditions. Fourth, English Baptist historians actually modified texts to fit the anachronisms. Americans, Australians, and Canadians canonized the anachronisms in their widely circulated versions of the English Baptist narrative and text. Few of them apparently had access to the actual original text and they relied on favored secondary authors. The result has been a multi-generational misreading of text, I would contend, and a misunderstanding of vocabulary and related theological deductions. Let's talk about the term for a moment. Contravening the secondary literature noted above, however, were evidences of a proto-particular Baptist theology that was differently focused on ecclesiological matters. Let us begin this line of investigation by looking at the term particular amongst early 17th century nonconformists. Five texts illustrate some contextual usage of the term particular. First, some guidance from the dictionary. The Oxford English Dictionary defined particular in mid 17th century as, and I quote, of or concerning a part, partial, particular, a part, section of a whole, a constituent part or element, not universal, restricted. The entry refers to Crosby in 1738, volume one, page 173, as Calvinistical have been termed particular Baptist, opposed to general Baptist, further citing under particularism, theology, the doctrine of particular election or redemption, uh, the dogma that divine grace is provided for or offered to a selected part, not the whole of the human race. Pages 506, 507. Alternate spelling is particular, particular, and particular. And I found it fascinating that the OED uh, editors and compilers actually went further to add yet another paragraph to their entry as follows. There have been two parties of English Baptists in England ever since the beginning of the Reformation, those that have followed the Calvinistical scheme of doctrines and from the principal point therein, personal election have been termed particular Baptist and those that have professed the Arminian or Remonstrant tenets, and have also from the chief of those doctrines, universal redemption been called general Baptists. Now to some specific contemporary nonconformist texts. I note in Thomas Helwys, the declaration of those remaining at Amsterdam, written in 1611, uh, the following words, that as one congregation hath Christ, so hath all, and that the word of God cometh not from any one, neither to any one congregation in particular, but to every particular church, as it doth unto all the world. And therefore, no church ought to challenge any prerogative over any other. And then, of course, significantly, and we'll see much more of this in a moment, in the first London Confession, 1644, editions in 46, 51, and 52, there are several instances of the use of the term particular. To all that may desire, quote, some one particular congregation, a spiritual kingdom, a peculiar inheritance, 
of saints, it being nowhere tied to a particular church officer or person extraordinarily sent. And in Article 47, particular congregations be distinct in several bodies, every one a compact and knit city in itself, yet are they all to walk by one and the same rule. In the Ilston book, 1650, which I have in fact worked at a special edition of, produced among followers of John Miles in Wales and then in uh, the colony of Massachusetts Bay, the churches are referred to as the messengers of the several churches of London, Hay, Lantrezant, etc. Likewise, in the first Midland records of May 1655, all the messengers of the churches met at Warwick, a particularly named church. In 1652, the Abington per particular churches of Christ agreed to hold a firm communion with each other in point of doubtful matters, to consult through choosing messengers, to keep the gospel from scandal, to prove their love for all the saints, to advance the work of God, to quicken the lukewarm, and to underscore their identity as true churches of Christ. And then I note in a general meeting of September 1657, messengers of the respective associations and churches meeting at and the particular names of the churches appear. And finally, recently through a joint project with uh, Larry Kreitzer, we've discovered John Perry's uh, use of the term particular in his 1654 treatise, Some Short Modern Animadversions, on a book lately published by Dr. Chamberlain entitled A Discourse Between Captain Kiffin and Dr. Chamberlain, etc., touching on the laying on of hands. The Savoy Declaration, Congregationalist inspired and written, 1658, Largely the work of Thomas Goodwin and John Owen, the Savoy Declaration represented the modifications of independent congregations to the Westminster Confession of Faith, 1646. As such, it is a useful uh, demonstration of usages in the greater independent community. I quote, of the institution and churches and the order appointed to them by Jesus Christ, section five, these particular churches, thus appointed under the authority of Christ. Section six, besides these particular churches, there is not instituted by Christ any church more extensive or Catholic entrusted with power for the administration of his ordinances or the execution of any authority in his name. And section seven, a particular church gathered and completed according to the mind of Christ consists of officers and members and then the Savoy Declaration identifies those officers and members in particular. The above text from the contemporary Congregationalist tradition clearly indicates, I think, the usage of the terminology particular churches as among Baptists of the same era also. Now, how exactly were these Baptist congregations named? If not yet called particular Baptist, how were these churches designated? A contemporary clue may be found in Daniel Featley's work reporting on the Anabaptist. With respect to the First London Confession, he referred to them as seven churches in London, rude and illiterate, mechanics without calling, enthusiasts, dreamers, and impostors, and he connected them to Anabaptists of old. Similarly, the Presbyterian heresiologist Thomas Edwards in 1646 followed Featley's path and cataloged the dissenters of his day, focusing upon William Kiffin, whom he described as a great ringleader of the seduced sect of Anabaptists. According to Edwards, Kiffin held to a newfound gospel light, so-called, and he directed his readers to a further manifestation of him in a pamphlet called the Confession of Faith of Seven Anabaptistical Churches, among whom he said Kiffin was written as a metropolitan of the fraternity. The Puritan historian Daniel Neal in 1733 offhandedly described these independents as set up by themselves and chose Mr. Jesse, 
their minister who laid the foundation of the first Baptist congregation that I have met with in England. All seem to agree that there were seven congregations, Calvinistical and theological outlook, referring to themselves as simply the churches of Christ, walking in the faith and order of the gospel, or simply as the baptized churches. As Dr. White suggested, the importance of the London theology and London leadership is evident throughout. Although he acknowledges the proper nomenclature in the mid 1640s as either the churches of Christ walking in the faith and order of the gospel or as simply the baptized churches. White was buttressed by his contemporary Murray J. Talmy, who invented the term Baptist independent churches to identify new congregations far and wide. Talmy wrote, the seven churches were one in communion. The articles of the confession relating to the church established the normal pattern for most, though not all subsequent particular Baptist churches in England. And he noted articles 33, 39, 40, 36, and 42. The typical particular Baptist church, he wrote, therefore, was to be thoroughly separatist and lay in character and restricted to members who had undergone believers' baptism. The separatist origin of the seven congregations was evident from the list of subscribers to the confession. He refers to Henry Jesse as perhaps the most important convert won by the particular Baptist in this decade. And further, Tolmy wrote, in the latter part of the decade, new Baptist leaders appeared, including Edward Drapes, John Fountain, William Consett, Mr. Tomlins, and Mr. Wade. They were all apparently members of the original seven churches. He also pointed out the continuation of non-Baptist separatist churches in London to make the contrast. The text evidence, then, from 1643 to 1660, suggest that the term particular, alternatively spelled particular, and that set me up to begin to be interested in investigating this, originally applied to specific instances of churches, usually named, among the associations and in the general meetings underscoring their independent identities. The use of the term particular with respect to Calvinistic Baptist in the 17th century pertained to congregational ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, not yet to soteriology, the doctrine of the atonement. Now, what are the theological implications then of a particular Baptist nomenclature. And here's the heart of what I'm trying to say in this lecture. The steps toward a working theological identity. Stage one, to resolve the problem of methodological anachronism, we need to turn to the original texts themselves. Our thesis here is that the original London churches were thinking theologically about their identity and their original focus was upon ecclesiology, that is, the congregational life and identity of particular or specific named congregations or churches, among which there was much variety. Henry Jesse, for instance, that they drew upon several precedents is not to be denied. Let us consider the usage found in the original texts themselves. The earliest textual witness to a Calvinistic Baptist presence in London is, of course, the Stinton Repository. It is a collection of 30 documents attesting to the beginnings of the London churches, the Jesse Church, Dutch Anabaptist, Irish congregations, etc., compiled about 1712. The following entries pertain. In 1644, page 12 in Stinton, quote, those that were so minded had communion together were become seven churches in London, also though falsely called Anabaptist and seven congregations or churches of Christ in London, the first London confession was issued, quote, 1643, of course, the calendar difference, the second printing was in 1644. And in uh, January the 9th, 
he writes, 53 members in all, 1644, those were so minded, had communion together, were become seven churches in London. And he explained in note 17 that Jesse and his group continued to baptize infants and they remained outside the circle of the seven. The issuance of the 1644 confession is a critical point in the creation of a consensual Calvinistic Baptist theology. We may agree, surely, with Dr. White that there were originally two primary theological sources for the ecclesiology of the seven churches around London. One was the Confession of 1644 and Benjamin Cox's addendum to the 1646 edition of the London Confession. Behind the 1644 document lies the work of John Spilsbury, who had written in his personal confession that the authority of congregations of believers united to Christ has the power and authority of Christ. In part, Spilsbury wrote further. And lastly, I do believe that there is a holy and blessed communion of saints that God in his grace calls such as belong to life by election under the fellowship of his son by the gospel, of which matter God by his word and spirit joins them together in his covenant of grace and so constitutes his church. The first London Confession, 1644, clearly declared, and though ye particular congregations be distinct seven several bodies, every one is a compact and knit city within itself. Yet they are all to walk by one rule of faith as members of one body in the common faith under Christ their head. This, I would contend, is the heart of the emerging theological identity of the seven London churches. White points out three distinguishing features, each of an ecclesiological nature. One, baptism by immersion by a qualified person. Two, improvements to the ministry, especially with the respect to the administration of baptism. And three, the avoidance of any link between church and state. White also identified a section where Synod of Dort related Calvinist principles were articulated or implied, and I fill that out more fully in a footnote. Dr. White's theological analysis overall is quite acceptable, but his reading of the text is anachronistic. Throughout, he refers to London churches as particular Baptist, noting textual uses of the term particular with respect to, not to election, but to baptism and the church. There is in fact no usage of the term particular with respect to a view of the atonement in any of the documents Dr. White cited. The elements of a London Baptist ecclesiology now become evident. First, that Christ hath here on earth a spiritual kingdom which at, with whom he is in covenant relationship. Secondly, Christ has entrusted power to his whole church and to every congregation of it to receive and cast out. Third, Christ has placed men to oversee, govern, and visit, and these include pastors, teachers, elders, and deacons. Article 47 enjoined intercongregational cooperation. To underscore the usage of the term particular, Article 42 reads, this power to receive in and cast out is given to every particular congregation and not one particular person, either member or officer, but the whole. The individual or particular churches were all to walk by one and the same rule, presumably the now published confession. The initial emphasis upon local ecclesiology inevitably led to a broadening doctrine of the church for Baptist. The 1644 Confession proved to be a springboard for at least one important later development, the association. At first, there was ecclesiological tension developing from the assumption that, the, that their churches were each under Christ, a compact and knit city in itself. Yet there were in 1644 important factors encouraging the first seven London Calvinistic Baptist congregations toward closer cooperation, a common confession, misunderstood public identities, etc. 
And this led ultimately to working towards the first general meeting of Baptist of Abingdon in November, 1650. Gradually, other associations affirmed this broadened ecclesiology. The West Country and Ireland corresponded. The churches of Ireland, Christ in Ireland, walking in the faith and order of the gospel, our dear friends, the churches of Christ in England and scattered brethren in several places have obtained like precious faith with us. Likewise, also the Ilston churches in Wales, 1650, the Berkshire Association, and even later the mentioning of a note about the Gloucester church. If the dominant theme of the first London confession was particular election, as secondary sources have long since Crosby tried to argue, that subject, election, is actually introduced in Article 5, then Article 21, ad seriatim, and yet in each instance the term particular is not used. In contrast, 18 other articles attest to the priority of the church, notably using the term particular or its correlates to modify the church or congregations no less than four times, Articles 33, 36, 41, uh, 45, and 47. Special note must be made of a document that appeared in 1650, appended to the most recent edition of the London Confession, 1646. It was entitled Heart Bleedings for Professors' Abominations. The signatories to this document include John Spilsbury, William Kiffin, William Consett, Edward Drapes, and Thomas Patient. The thrust of the work is to respond to several theological slanders leveled against the Baptist, notably from the Ranters and the Quakers. Nowhere in the document is there any reference to election, perseverance, or predestination. We now turn to the minutes of the Abingdon Association again in the period 1650 to 1660 as a model of the emerging Calvinistic Baptist identity. The general meetings of the Abingdon Association Calvinistic Baptist produced a new regional ecclesiology. In 1652, their nine theological principles were clearly articulated. And I want to be specific here. One, there is the same relation betwixt the particular churches, each towards the other, as there is betwixt particular members of one church. Two, the churches of Christ do all make up one body or church in general under Christ their head. Three, and all the partic particular assemblies are but one Mount Zion. Four, the particular churches of Christ ought to hold a firm communion each with other in point of advice in doubtful matters and controversies. Five, Every church ought to manifest its care over the other churches as fellow members of the same body of Christ in general do rejoice and mourn with them according to the law of their near relation in Christ. Six, to keep each other pure and to clear the profession of the gospel from scandal which cannot be done. Seven, orderly walking churches be owned orderly and disorderly churches be orderly disowned even as disorderly walking members of a particular church. Eight, the greater scandal by not witnessing against the defection of a church or churches. Nine, for the proof of their love to all saints, particular church communion being never appointed as a restraint of our love, which should be manifest itself to all the churches. A first step in realizing the broadened relationship was the circulation of a letter among the London and Abingdon churches to create particular assemblies based on the Abingdon model and the agreement to keep a record of proceedings of remarkable transactions. The particularist emphasis on the doctrine of the church continued through 1660, and I quote, taking into consideration the present state of Zion in general and more especially of the assemblies of Zion in this land, and more particularly of those particular churches who have partly by their messengers and partly by their letters now made known unto us their particular states, 
we have judged it expedient as part of our duty now to offer it to your consider serious consideration, whether it be not now seasonable and necessary for all the churches, both to be very earnest in seeking the face of the Lord, and also in this work to set apart such time or times as they shall see to be the most convenient for the seeking of the Lord by prayer with fasting. And I happen to know just in a survey of other association records from this period, the 1650s, the spelling is clearly particular in the Berkshire Association. And again, in uh, noting uh, uh, elements about the Gloucester Church. Thus, we can conclude that the usage of the term particular as applied to congregations was ratified among the association, associations. Now let us move to stage two and what I think is the developing theology of the Calvinistical Baptists. A second stage of theological identity evolved among Calvinistic Baptists in London and the counties with the embracement of terms emphasizing Calvinist themes such as predestination, personal election, and final perseverance. We note the statement presenting a limited election view in the First London Confession, 1644, Article 21, Jesus Christ by his death did purchase salvation for the elect that God gave unto him. These only have interest in him and fellowship with him. To them alone doth God by his spirit apply his redemption unto, as also the free gift of eternal life is given to them and none else. This is the foundation for the later usage, personal election. Historian Mark Bell has identified a second very important theological transition point from ecclesiology to soteriology, if you will. In Benjamin Cox's appendix to the 1646 edition of the London Confession entitled An Appendix to a Confession of Faith was a response to some well-affected godly persons in the country. Cox was previously the vicar of Tiverton, Devon, who was much enamored of predestination. He emphasized the Calvinistic focus on Christ's death for the elect only and the eternal punishment of the lost. Successively, Cox appended 22 articles clarifying eternal punishment, election, the law and grace, justification and imputation, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Cox seemed to be striving for compatibility with the Westminster divines. Here then is a shift towards soci soteriological emphases. Yet, Cox did not yet employ the terminology particular election. Next, one begins to notice a subtle theological evolution among the associations. This occurred in the London, Western, Abingdon and Welsh associations and among the Irish churches correspondence. A major step was taken in theological transition in 1675. Responding to a bill of indulgence, the London Baptist, William Consett, Daniel Dyke, and William Kiffin issued a call to address various matters proposed for an assembly to be held in London. Owing to continued persecution, the meeting did not occur until 1677. A momentous decision was made to approve a new confession, quote, to manifest our consent in all the fundamental articles of the Christian religion, as also with many others, where orthodox confessions have been published to the world on the behalf of the Protestants in diverse nations and cities. Many others have pointed out the strength in Calvinism of the Second London Confession. Using the order of the Westminster Confession and comparable texts from the Congregationalist Savoy Declaration, we find emphasis of Calvinist articles, which included of God's decree, divine providence, of God's covenant, of effectual calling, justification, uh, of perseverance of the saints and of the church. The principal editor of the New Confession was William Collins of the Petty France Church. 
and certainly William Kiffin and Hansard Knowles, Knowles oversaw the text. 11 years later, there were 36 signatories representing over 100 congregations identified with the 1688 edition of the Confession. Worthy of note, nowhere in the second confession is the language used particular redemption. We now move to acknowledge the efforts of the Calvinistic Baptists to create a national or comprehensive doctrine of the church. By 1689, the London churches had circularized the churches in the country to meet at London to put things in order on a broader basis. It was intended to be a general meeting of the Calvinistic Baptist churches. Here we find the first usage of particular Baptist churches. The language of owning the doctrines of personal election and final perseverance first appeared in 1689 and continued through the 1690s. In the minutes of their assembly, May 3rd to 24, 1692, they made the clear distinction between particular Baptist churches. That is to say, they were Baptist churches which rejected the opinions of Arminius, in contrast with general Baptist or Arminians who did not own the doctrines of personal election and final perseverance. The official record of this key meeting was published as the narrative of the proceedings of the General Assembly of Divers, Pastors, Messengers, and Ministry Brethren of the Baptized Churches met together in London from September 3 to 12, 1689, from diverse parts of England and Wales, owning the doctrine of personal election and final perseverance, sent from and concerned for more than 100 congregations of the same faith with themselves. Four years later, the churches in the West took the lead with calling for a sharpened doctrinal identity. Ivamy noted that the issues were discussed at several venues in the West before the General Assembly in Bristol, 1691 to 93. And I note the title of uh, the published proceedings uh, that occurred in April 1693, uh, where the Western churches met according to the arrangement of 1691, uh, to which all the churches in the West sent their representatives. And I note for my own particular future research, the importance of Andrew Gifford and George Founds, who played major roles and were appointed messengers back and forth from Bristol to London. Surely they carried the interest in a more sharply a Calvinistic uh, theology. The national organization language languished the next year, and from this period we apprehend the General Assembly was discontinued in London, as we hear no more of any correspondence between Bristol and London, nor of any meeting at the latter place. The London churches had greatly declined, according to Ivamy. Uh, however, the Western churches had a strong associational life through the turn of the century and referred to themselves as particular Baptist or simply the baptized churches. In 1693, the Western churches represented in London agreed to the preparation of a catechism by William Collins and approved the confession of faith to be translated into Latin, which they described as, quote, Publish to the world a standing monument to your honor in ages to come, as in this age it hath much taken away your reproach amongst all sorts of Protestants. Simon, if we could have the final um, uh, slide, the conclusions. The conclusion of the matter. We have revisited the original text of English Calvinistic Baptist, and I believe determined that the terminology particular Baptist as a proper noun does not appear until the 1690s. Second, when the term particular or particular is used, it modifies congregations. Third, this has led to the recovery of the original theological ethos of the English Calvinistic Baptist which is in the, 
<laughs> excuse me, in the main about the doctrine of the church. Fourth, under the influence of English Presbyterians and Congregationalists, the Calvinistic Baptist embraced more definitively Calvinistic themes, notably election, predestination, and perseverance. Fifth, the influence of the Western associations of churches centered in Bristol was of paramount importance in moving toward a sharpened Calvinistic nomenclature. The role of Andrew Gifford of Bristol is noteworthy. Sixth, the application of particular Baptist nomenclature before the 1690s is largely the result of historical anachronism. Finally, the accurate terminology for, in my opinion, for the earliest English Baptist evolved from the London separatist is simply Calvinistic Baptists. Now, I want to conclude my lecture on what I hope will be a humorous note. Um, some of you uh, use the term football in one way, and those in North America use the term football in another way. This is a football illustration because I couldn't find a soccer ball. The story is told of the National Football League team, the Dallas Cowboys, um, in the years of Tom Landry, their great coach, that on the very first day of spring training, he would assemble all of the players before him in a semicircle. Now, this included millionaire dollar players. It included people who had been playing for over a decade. It included people who really understood what playing football was all about. But Coach Landry held up a football, just like this, as the story goes. And he said, gentlemen, this is a football. And we begin here. Well, you can imagine, as the story was shared with me, the grumbling and the hooting and the laughter of these men who stood there and said things like, what's this guy, is this guy for real? Doesn't he know that we all know what a football is? I mean, come on, this is a football. Sometimes we are in danger, aren't we, of missing the obvious. Thank you for listening, and that's enough football for the day. Thank you, Bill, and perhaps friends gathered uh, who would ordinarily uh, give a round of applause at this point might use the reactions button to do so, or otherwise you can gesture uh, like so to express our appreciation to you. Um, for those fascinating insights into uh, a re uh, rethinking of, of uh, the terminology of particular Baptists. Um, I'd also like to give a, a quick plug here for the, and I'm grateful to you for drawing attention to the importance of uh, Stinton's repository, uh, which is one of the items that the Angus Library and Archive has just digitised thanks to the Friends of the Angus. So soon that will be available to everyone around the world to be able to uh, follow through with some of the uh, ideas that, that you've been drawing to our attention, Bill. Um, if I could encourage friends gathered to use the uh, chat to send me um, some questions. Um, I wonder if I can um, perhaps ask a kind of general background uh, question to start off, Bill. Um, in, in terms of you, um, you, you gave us some indication as to how the conversation went with Larry about, you know, when did the term particular come to be used? Was there anything um, that, that led you to this particular, this, it's it, interesting how often one uses the word particular uh, in, con in, in passing conversation. You know, what led you to this, this question in the first place? Thank you, Christine. That is a, for me, a really important question. From my work with the General Baptist, I was, I was very interested in where the term and what the term specifically was about General Baptist. General Baptist preferred the term General Atonement Baptist until later when they had their General Assembly, of course. Um, and they certainly distinguished themselves from the more Calvinistical form of Baptist. So 
I guess I began to wonder, okay, if there's a history behind the nomenclature of General Baptist, and by the way, I'm among those who would deny that General Baptists were true Arminians, because I don't think there's much evidence at all that I've found yet about their dependence upon the writings of Jacobus Arminius, but in fact, that was later applied in the 18th century uh, among other kinds of Baptists. Um, so I turned to uh, the particular Baptist and wondered, what have we got at stake here? Is there a, a denomination that has rootage all the way back to 1633 or 1638 or six? So that, that was a curiosity for me. But, but in addition to that, uh, there are numerous books and parts of the Baptist movement worldwide who continue to claim an unbroken history of particular Baptist theology. And so that really piqued my interest. What, what do we have here? Have we looked carefully? And so I hope that answers the question in some way. Thank you. Um, if friends are not familiar with the chat, do please feel free to wave and gesture and I will try and spot you on the screen. Christine, I might just, if I can ask something, uh, Bill, I might not have um, caught the whole of the paper and it might be there in the footnotes, but I wondered if you'd been reading Matthew Bingham's work, Orthodox Radicals, which seems to be making a similar kind of argument that we need to be careful about this language in particular. Thank you so much. I have. I'm very familiar with that good book and it's found in my notes. Um, I found myself... Uh, at a position where I couldn't include everything, but it's in the notes and I have a good deal of respect for that. I think he and I are on the same wavelength. I don't think you'll find in Matthew's work uh, any necessary attention to the stages that I tried to identify, but bang on, yes, thank you. Um, Emily Pagoyne, would you like to ask your question, please? <clears throat> Well, I really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. That was really good. Um, I wondered whether or not, um, whether or not, what to what extent amongst other dissenting churches, the same kind of variance in, in nomenclature, if you'd come across that maybe with other kind of um, dissenting groups, or whether or not it was just a kind of a Baptist thing that there was a sort of shifting all the time and how they define themselves and how they've been defined subsequently. Again, a really good question that I haven't explored too much, but I would suspect that in the, as Christopher Hill has argued, we, we don't have firm denominational categories. We've got things in uh, flux mm -hmm. and uh, identities. And so, you know, an individual congregation is calling itself this over there and a group mm -hmm. of them meeting together is calling this over there. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I don't want to be critical of our ancestors. I, I value and, and honor them hugely, but it was somewhat unclever to identify themselves as the seven churches in London. I mean, it was as though, yeah, we're, we're going to figure this out sooner or later. And of course, it does go on. And uh, the baptized churches, churches of the baptized way. So I suspect among, uh, certainly is true among Sabbath keepers, that they could not figure out what they were. And in fact, today, speaking with the uh, historian of the Seventh-day Baptist General Conference, you know, he makes reference to the first and second London Baptist Confessions of Faith, theologically. So there you are, but that's a really good question. <laughs> Thank you, that's a good answer. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can I invite Paul Warden to unmute, please? Thank you, Chris. Uh, Bill, I was, I was wondering, um, I, I was captured in my mind about Shakespeare's uh, kind of phrase, a rose by any other name. And, and so I was wondering, moving ahead, we've got uh, this, this name for these Calvinistic uh, Baptists that we call them particular. And we've made that to mean 
particular atonement. And I, I understand what you're saying, but it's not a soteriological question. What's the significance going ahead? What, how, how, why does this matter? It matters because to me, Paul, uh, I mean, it, that's a great question about the relevance, continuing relevance of theology at all. What does it have to do with anybody today? And it matters to me because I believe at the heart of Baptist identity is the doctrine of the church. And I think there is a lot fit into our evolving doctrine of the church, um, the church under Christ, the congregation under Christ, the whole church under Christ, but it's all about the doctrine of the church. And so for me, if we're looking as a group worldwide to some kind of renewal of our theological self-identity, we should look no further than the church under Christ. Does that help? Yeah, it sure does. Thanks a lot. Okay. And um, Brian Tolbert, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Thanks, Bill. I uh, really enjoyed your, your lecture. Thank you, Brian. I'm, like everybody else, was intrigued by Matthew Bingham's book, uh, questioning some of the vocabulary and terminology. Um, I was a little puzzled by what appears to be the, his claim that the Calvinistic Baptists didn't have a conscious identity as a network of churches till into the 18th century. That seems rather late to me. He doesn't go on to explain about that. I was wanted to ask you when you thought was the kind of earliest date of a consciously Calvinistic Baptist group of churches as opposed to general Baptist churches. Which I, my thought would be, I think it has to be the 17th, still in the 17th century, not as late as the 18th. But what are your thoughts? Thank you, Brian. Excellent question. Um, and by the way, I think, I, I think that, I think that Matthew is following the lead of Barry White at that point, <clears throat> who has suggested that one cannot rule out the whole issue of education and support for education, because that was one of the major reasons uh, from the association minutes for churches associating together to help people uh, be trained better for ministry. And of course, that, that was an interesting difference of outlook between the London uh, churches and the establishment of the particular Baptist fund, and of course, the Bristol tradition and the Terrell Trust and, and all of that. Um, I, I do not agree that we have to wait until the 18th century to see a strong national, certainly regional denominational tradition uh, with a little d, please, <laughs> uh, for the Calvinistic group. I think it is in uh, 1692. Uh, surely, and I, I see steps taken along the way. I think if we would have had Benjamin Cox and, and uh, some of these other, William Kiffin, certainly, in our midst for an interview, they would have described something like a uh, Calvinistic Baptist denomination of varying names. And it's fascinating to go to the records and find the entries using different names until finally that second London Confession is publicly produced, 1688, and assented to by 100 churches. I think that's the key point. Thank you, Bill. Um, can I invite Wayne Clark to unmute and ask his question? Please? <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, I suppose I was wondering, Bill, if, if the first particular Baptists were defining themselves as particular by their ecclesiology rather than by their soteriology or some other doctrinal position, then what, what you think they were defining themselves against, who, who they were not? Uh, do you think they were saying we are not the established church, we are not part of the Catholic church with a small c, if that term would have been, I think that term would still have been in currency at the time, or we are not another kind of Baptist. What, what, what were they not if they were particular Baptists? Oh, thank you for the wonderful question. 
I think about my predecessor at the American Baptist Historical Society, Edward C. Starr, in his 26 volume Baptist bibliography that built on Whitley, where his, his title was A Baptist Bibliography of Works by, for, about, comma, and against the Baptists. And I think that is a very important point. Namely, they were, they were fighting against slander. Uh, heart bleedings is another illustration of that. Um, the the uh, catechism that comes out later uh, by William Collins is another illustration. And I think the chief difficulties or the chief adversaries, if you will, theologically, were uh, the heresiologists who were slandering them about what they thought we were doing, our ancestors were doing with baptism, um, <clears throat> but also trying to associate us with the anabaptistical types, uh, a radical form of Christianity that nobody seemed to appreciate in 17th century England. And then, sorry, in the earlier period, I think they're speaking out against Presbyterians uh, who really were trying to bring this group into tow and finally, succeeded in, in my head, uh, along with them, Congregationalists and those people like Henry Jesse who kept straddling both sides of the fence. And, uh, you know, that, that, that literature of an adversarial kind is huge and significant. Many people have written about it, but I think a nomenclatural study could be very revealing. Thank you, Bill. Um, can I invite Simon to unmute and ask his question? Thanks, Chris. Um, yes, yeah, so Whitley suggested that the Seven Churches of London was a conscious parallel of the Seven Churches of Revelation and that they carried on using it even after it ceased to be quite accurate. And I just wondered if you think that these churches were self-referentially seeing themselves as a kind of fresh incarnation of the Churches of Revelation existing in the midst of you know, the Roman Empire. I do indeed. Thank you for pointing that out, <clears throat> Simon. I, I keep saying that's in the footnotes as well, but but I'm a Whitley fan at this point. I'm, I'm not prepared to throw him out with <laughs> modernity as, as some do. Um, and yeah, I, I think Baptists were, I think Baptists were carefully biblical in that sense. Um, but I also think there were seven congregations identifiable uh, in and around London and uh, that grew beyond that. But uh, the ongoing theme there could well be an apocalyptic theme born out of the book of Revelation. That's a, that's a beautiful parallel, actually. Mm. Bill, could I mention one other interesting fact about <clears throat> the number seven uh, and description of the seven churches in London? Of course, that only appears in the first two editions, 1644 and 1646. It doesn't right. appear in 1651, 1652. Then the language shifts to several congregations and they, they drop the reference to seven. Uh, but interesting in the 1646, in other words, the second um, uh, printing of the confession, it is the seven congregations of London plus one French congregation. Right. And we often forget that there is this rather unknown and unexplored French edition, which I think ultimately goes back to the fact that it's Huguenots that are being supported by yeah. William Kiffin. Oh, thank you, Dr. Kreitzer. Um, I could depend on you for digging into that uh, nomenclature. Um, yes, you know, the subtitle there is From Seven to Several. And obviously, yes. growth uh, would not allow to hold that on because there's nothing that I can detect of particular honor for the original seven. I mean, some of them we know even came and went. So thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, one other interesting thing is if you want to say how are they defining themselves, maybe not as particular Baptists, but they do often use the language of their pastor or walking with their pastor that's the way in which they often describe themselves. It's not, a, you know, um, a particular Baptist church. It's a church of Christ and those walking with William Kiffin or walking with Thomas Spilsbury or some other. So the idea of a collective um, journey 
is very much part of who they are in defining themselves as well. I made a note of that, Larry. Thank you. I, I also find numerous references in the Abingdon minutes, um, the, the Church of Christ at X place, Wapping or yep. wherever. So they are geographically defined. And, yep. and uh, that sends me back to think, uh-huh. Um, so, yeah, those early records are simply uh, great treasures for a study like this. It, it's, it's, not, it's the obvious, but it's not so obvious. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Um, could I invite uh, John uh, Shoes and Chris Chun to ask their question? Oh. Yes, we have a, a group meeting here from California. Chris has the question. My goodness. <laughs> thank you for your presentation. I'll wait a little bit. Oh, thank you, Chris and John. Thank you for so it sounds like um, you, the, the issues that you have is the nomenclature of particular baptism, of particular Baptist. But you, from your conclusion, I gather you did not have problems labeling these folks, Henry, Jesse, and Stillsbury, and others, as a um, Calvinistic Baptist. Is that right? Absolutely correct. Bang on, Chris. Um, I, I know the group, as you know the group, and we can identify it, uh, but, but it is a nomenclature study that I think has theological implications. So again, if that's the case, do you think it would be fair to look at them in sort of like how we look at the Reformation before uh, Hoffman and Germany uh, um, um, the Reformation? Uh, you, you all people often historian points out um, you know, Huss as or, or Wycliffe and Huss as a forerunner of the Reformation. Can we see these um, uh, people like Henry Jesse as a forerunner of the particular Baptist? Would that work? Yes, it will. By the way, is that Gary sitting there in the middle of you two? No, no. David Rachel. David Rachel, good to see you. Oh, hi, David. <laughs> <laughs> well. Yeah, uh, I, I really like that um, idea of mixing it up a bit from the traditional magisterial categories. You all know that I am a devotee from Mennonite influence, um, James Steyer and others, of a polygenetic view of Baptist origins. And so rather than looking after a dominant group, a, a group which later becomes dominant, I'm interested in the multifarious, the variegated streams, and I think they're all over the place. Um, and in fact, some congregations even thought that they were a kind of movement in themselves. Thomas Lamb's congregation did, and he itinerated and spread the Lamb gospel all through uh, uh, the south of England. So um, I'm, I'm convinced that with Christopher Hill, but maybe for different reasons than he had, um, this doesn't come together as quickly as moderns think it did. It took a half a century, but then things were beginning to harden. The act of toleration made it possible to come out into the open, to publish, to train ministers, and so forth. But thanks for the question. I appreciate that California glow at this hour of the day. It's very early. <laughs> we have to get up. We're here at the home at 6 30 in the morning. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. I was there was a slight pause there while I was reading Alison Overton's uh, comment in the chat, which was expressing appreciation given that she's in the uh, context of the Berkshire Association or for the first 20 years of their ministry were in that context and so similarly I, I feel likewise given that my home church is Abingdon Baptist Church so it's been oh, good to hear uh, some of some of this uh, kind of influence that the Abingdon uh, Association uh, had in this uh, discussion. 
Um, I, I wondered, Bill, if you could say a little more. I mean, and this goes back to Wayne Clark's question, really, about the kind of defining oneself against someone else. Um, and, and just really in terms of whether your nomenclature study has thrown up issues of, you know, kind of where it's used um, sort of positively from an internal perspective and pejoratively from an external perspective in terms of how, how the, you know, you mentioned in a couple of contexts seem to be quite polemical and that, the, you know, the, the way that terminology was being used. Yeah, another good question. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't want to make too much of the title page of the first London Confession, 1644 and 46, as Larry has reminded us. Um, you know, there in the title, you've got a loaded uh, situation where they're just declaring, those churches are declaring problems they're having with being slandered. And then there are other many, many tracks that attempt to do the same thing. But when you actually go into the content, article by article of the London Confession, and it improves even more in the uh, congeniality of the second confession, you... <laughs> you actually see the positivity, the positive declaration of who we are and what we are. Um, and I, I find that a very positive identification factor. It's, once again, it's all about the church and they wanna make some specific statements about uh, the other major doctrinal categories. And um, it, it was meant to uh, fulfill a need of a positive identity. And, and I think the fact that, uh, <laughs> publisher would love to hear this, but I think the fact that uh, by 1660 uh, or so, there are no more copies available for sale of that London Confession. It's, it's, it's not being reprinted, it's time to do something else. Um, that says a lot about the positive reception among the churches. And when I read finally in the Western Association and among the Irish church co uh, correspondences that uh, they are quoting the same rule of, of faith and practice and believers baptism and so forth, there's a very positive witness and identification there of who these people think they are. And I think they have moved away from uh, the adversarial language with um, the Presbyterians and the heresiologists and whatever. Thank you very much. Stan Fowler, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, hi, Bill, Stan. hi. Much of the, much of the literature uh, that talks about the general versus particular nomenclature of the 17th century phrases it in terms of general atonement versus particular atonement. And yet, in, in your description of the developing uh, terminology, the, the concepts that come up are more about election than atonement. And election and atonement are, in fact, distinct issues. I mean, as, as you and I both know, you have the whole Amaraldian four-point <laughs> Calvinism stream. Um, so as, as you read the literature, whenever they do use those terms, it, is it specifically about atonement or is it really about election? I thank you, Stan, you, you've uh, brought a corrective, an important one. I, I was blending the two in the overall idea of salvation, uh, but I think there is a very distinct difference in the terminology in the documents between discussions of election, which is usually early on referred to as personal election, uh, and then the work of Christ, which is not diminished in any way uh, throughout both the first and second London confessions. So um, yeah, I thank you for that. That's important to, to heed. Yep. It is more about election um, than uh, atonement. I think that I think I should modify that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I've um, 
uh, we've we've had all the ones that have been posed in the chat but if you would like to wave if if there's anything else you'd like to contribute Uh, while we're waiting, Christine, I have a confession to make. Um, Malcolm Yarnell is involved in this conversation. And I'm sorry to have used a Dallas Cowboys football image, holding up of all things, the Washington Redskins, the, the <laughs> sworn adversaries. I mean, it would be like particular and general Baptist. So Malcolm, <laughs> please take no offense to that. <laughs> Well, if there are no more questions, then at this point, I'll invite my uh, colleague, Keith Jones, to um, offer our word of thanks. Thank you very much, Christine. Uh, thank you to everybody for being with us from the North Sea to the Pacific, it seems. What a fantastic gathering. Uh, and especially, we want to extend our deepest appreciation to our friend and colleague, Bill, uh, for what's been a fascinating lecture. Uh, sometimes we use these words like particular in a very easy way. We think we know the answer, but what you've given us this afternoon has been an important corrective, a reminder to look back at the earliest sources. And we thank you very much indeed for that. Plenty of things to reflect on uh, and to consider. Bill, uh, as always, you have informed us and delighted us and given us real food for thought. So on behalf of the Baptist Historical Society uh, of the United Kingdom, on behalf of uh, the Centre for Baptist Studies at Regents Park College, we extend our deepest and warmest appreciation to you and value you as a great thinker and friend, no doubt of the majority of folk who've been listening to you and valuing what you've had to say this afternoon. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Keith, and blessed be the tie that binds. Yeah. <laughs> to the right tune. Right. <laughs> yeah.